Joshua chapter 7, we're going to be picking up with verse 6. I'm only going to read down through uh, verse 9, a portion of. But this is a message that is a carry on, a carry over from last week. And next Sunday we'll be moving into chapter 8. I don't want you to jump overboard yet because if you were here last Sunday, you know the service and especially the message was somewhat steamy and very direct and really it called us out in our sin, didn't it? But I want you to understand, if I don't preach you the entire counsel of God, the entire word of God, I can't sit up here and preach heaven to you all the time. You know, I've got to give you today those things that will improve, improve or enrich your life in your walk because we're all subject. We're all subject to sin every day. We're all facing difficulties in our life every day. Sure, we need the comfort. We need the encouraging messages. But we also need the messages sometimes that just pulls us right up to the throne room of God where we have to really get right with him. So today, that's not all this message is. But last Sunday on August the 1st, we encountered the Achan that was breaking God's heart. And of course, Achan was a man who sinned against not only God, but he, because of his sin, it had an influence and, an, and really brought reproach on Israel. Additionally, a tragedy happened. And the bad part and the reason this tragedy happened is because God was not on the scene. You mean God wasn't there? Let me tell you what. God is never going to condone and endorse sin. He will never today bless sin. Today, he was not invited and therefore Israel suffered tremendous loss and failure because of their walk and because of their disobedience. And they set the stage. They set the stage for the failure. And if you're not careful, you can set the stage in your life for failure. Think in your life, well, I can do what I want to do and it only affects me. You better rethink that. Because everything that you do not only affects you, but affects your family and affects others too. Our life has an effect upon everyone. So what is the lesson, Pastor? The lesson is simply this. AI is really a snapshot for us today that have inward difficulty and problems arising out of, of, of our life that's full of lust, the world, which God says you cannot and you will not have. God is never going to let you sin and get by with it. There is a payday that comes with that. You mark my word. And it comes in different fashions and forms. We, we do that which dishonors God. And when we find ourselves today... We look and we see ourselves as prey to the, e to the evil forces of this world because we're drawn into that. All of a sudden, we're not looking to the Lord. We're looking to ourselves. We're trying to find the door out. We're trying to get out of what we're in. We're trying to get past and we're trying to cover our tracks. You can never do that because be sure your sins will find you out. The word of God says, right? So we have no power to stand today. We experienced failure and defeat. And Israel did that. And you know, they didn't only do it once. They did it multiple times. And then you think about your life, our lives today. Because we all have failures in our life, don't we? We have failures because of our decisions. We have failures because of our flesh. We have failures because of influence. And we find ourselves in positions today that our life is falling apart. I want to warn you today. And especially in these days in which we're living, do not take God lightly. Today, he's nothing to play with. You cannot sin and get by with it. You cannot live haphazardly, carelessly, and think you can do whatever you want to do, any way you want to do it, any time you want to do it, and get by with it, because it will not work. You may think you are, and you may think, well, I can get through this, and I've gotten through that. And I mean, really, does God really care? I'm going to tell you, he really does care. And if you don't believe that, look at this cross and remind yourself of the price that was paid for our redemption and what Christ did for us through his blood and sacrifice at the cross. It does have influence. If God ignored sin, then he would no longer be a holy God. But he does not ignore sin, does he? Sin mattered to God and so much that he sent Jesus to die for our sin on the cross. I mean, he paid a price that you and I had no, no ability to pay. All the riches of this world could not pay for your sin. Nothing in life today can really today atone for your sin as far as the flesh and the world is concerned. There's only one atoning measure and that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only he can wash your sins away. Only he can blot out your transgressions. Only he can remove your iniquities. And thank God he can and he will put us in a right standing when we come before him and seek his face and know that he's a God who can be found. Amen. 
So God's wrath, it burns against sin. You know why? Because God loved us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here are two points that you need to ponder. One, today's sin always brings consequences that must be faced. Well, Pastor, I thought God, and through the process of repentance, he forgives the sin. He sure does. And he will, and that's a promise from God. Today, repentance will remove the guilt of sin. But it doesn't necessarily remove the consequences of sin. Sin comes with consequences, doesn't it? You pay for your sins. You just can't go out, and I know that... the. Country music and the rock industry has written all kinds of songs and sung all kinds of songs about go live any way you want to live, do whatever you want to do, be whatever you want to be, and hey, it's all right, and in the end it'll all work out. No, it won't. The consequences, you drink all your life, and then you go to the doctor and you got cirrhosis of the liver. That's the consequences of sin. And there are many other things today, and I just use that as an example. But you've got to be careful of your sin life today. Secondly today, Satan's a liar. Let me say that again. Satan is a liar. Today he buys your soul today with counterfeit promises today. Because he is today one that wants to deceive you and draw you down to the place of defeat. Satan lies, he cheats, he steals, and he'll do everything he can to destroy your soul. And if you don't believe that, read John 10 and 10. For the thief cometh not but to kill, steal, and to destroy. But I'm glad that's not the final finality of things because Jesus says, I have come. Christ has come through the cross, through the atonement, through his grace. I have come that you can have life and have it more abundantly. You don't have to live the way the world is living. And folks, I'm glad I can wake up and feel the power and the presence of God in my life and to know today that my mind is clear, my heart is clean, and that I can love God, serve God, and be blessed of God. Amen. Amen. We've got to put God first. I've always said this. Satan sails a sinking ship, and he rules a doomed domain. What do we need to do? What do we need to do then, preacher? You've got to die to your sin. Oh, but it brings pleasure. Oh, it may bring pleasure for a season, but the end result is it's going to bring destruction. You can actually enjoy sin. I remember the days, my younger days, when I was in the military, my first assignment. And you know, folks, I got into some things that I shouldn't have gotten into. I started drinking a lot by the power of influence. (laughs) I wasn't married then. But I was a girl about 200 miles south of me. I know we'll forget the night. I called her. I was about half lit. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm out getting drunk. Holy moly. She plowed deep. And she plowed long. You know what? When I finished the conversation on that that pay phone, I didn't necessarily sober up, but I got myself out of that bar that night and didn't go back. Amen. But then things started to happen, and I'm just giving you an example through my own personal life. Because if I wasn't at a bar drinking, I was somebody's house drinking. And all of a sudden, I started waking up in the mornings. And guess what? I wasn't craving coffee because I didn't drink it. I was craving alcohol. I got the taste for it. And thank God, even in my lost condition, I was smart enough to listen to the conviction that came with that, that I didn't need it. And thank the Lord, after that, I didn't drink no more. And after that, I got saved. And after that, my life has changed. And after that, God has miraculously worked in and through my life. Let me tell you what, Satan wants to drag you down to the depths of defeat. He wants to discourage you. And it's just not in the substance that we take into our bodies. It's what we also take into our minds. 
It's the influences that we have around us. It's the things that happen to us. It's the things that we let dominate us. It's the things that we let drag us down. It's the power of influence because you know what? Satan knows exactly when to hit the button when you're at your lowest ebb to draw you into that web of defeat and to entice you that you'll fall and you'll jump off the cliff into that sin that is awaiting you. But I'm going to tell you what that sin will do to you. It will destroy you. It will kill you. And you may wake up in hell because you hadn't known Christ as your personal Savior. Folks, the best thing you can do to sin is die to sin. Lose the taste for it today in Christ. Thank God we find the mercy that we need. Take your Bibles and join me in, in the book of Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. As we will read only those verses, but I will reference the rest of the verses through the chapter. Don't get anxious and think, oh my Lord, we'll be here till 3 o'clock. <laughs> well, if we are, we are, I guess. We can send Horace out for his world famous fried chicken game. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I got to loosen you up a little bit because I got to hit you hard. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Starting with verse 6, And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. That's a representation of humility and repenting. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God. This is an important verse here. He loses a little focus. O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. You can't go back and change anything in the rearview mirror. You need to take that mirror down and look forward. Learn from your mess ups and all the things of your past and learn to anchor yourself in Christ today. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before thy enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall, shall hear of it and shall environ, that means to encircle or to encompass us around, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? Very interesting portion of scripture there. I find a mixture of things that, that Joshua is saying to God. So, you know, you know what this is about, right? You know what this message is about, don't you? You know what this passage is about, don't you? This is about trouble. This is about something every one of us tastes in life. This is about something if you're not careful, it'll move in and not leave. This is about the things that we face in life and how we can combat those things and how we can be victorious over those things today. It's talking about genuine trouble. And I'm going to tell you, trouble is genuine today. And if you've ever been through it, which I think all of you probably have, and those who are watching by Facebook, we've all been through trouble, haven't we? I'm not just talking about things that goes on in our life in the loss of someone or a problem in life or a, a humiliating uh, issue or a sickness or things. I'm talking about when trouble shows up, when pain shows up, when sickness shows up, when sin shows up, and the things that we face sometimes we're there in those places and it's because of our own neglect and our own fault. Haven't we all been there? Sure. Some sins we've committed. Some places in life we're just flat messed up. And I'm going to tell you, you're never going to get victory over sin until you come clean with God. Other times, we have been victims of it. Because sin of others has an effect upon us. And this is the world that we're living in. We're inundated. You can't walk out of the building if it's not sin out there staring you in the face. Someone said, you know, a thought today, well, does sin affect me because of somebody else's sin? Yes, it does. So therefore, you don't, you don't live on an island in your life and think, well, I can do what I want to do, live any way I want to live, be whatever I want to be, and if I sin and mess up, it's my business. Oh, no, it's not. 
Your mess ups affect other people and bring a lot of grief. Think about little children sitting at home this morning and they don't have food on the table because that idiot drank up all the money or smoked all the money or sucked up all the money or shot up all the money on something else. It always happens. And it always happens at the worst time too, doesn't it? It always shows up in a time where you get into this rant about, why me? Why am I going through this? Maybe today, if you look close in the mirror, it's because of you it showed up. Satan likes to get a big bang out of the buck, doesn't he? And he likes to do it at your expense and mine. He likes to use our lives because he wants to destroy you. Satan is smarter than you think. He actually knows the scriptures. But let me tell you what. There's no hope for him. But in the scriptures, there's hope for you and I. There's pain in this chapter. There's trouble in this chapter. You say, whew, man, whew, wipe the sweat. Joshua had been going through a tremendous victory that God had provided. God, God had strengthened him and the people, and they had been encouraged in the great feats of victory that God had provided for them. Jordan had been crossed, and the covenant had been renewed, and Joshua had, and the children of Israel had seen, uh, had seen Jericho conquered, and through really going and marching around walls and giving a shout and raising up the trumpets and blowing them and carrying the ark of the Lord, which is the presence of God. Oh, I tell you, when you get God in your presence, you don't want to sin, amen. When you realize his greatness and his goodness, you don't want to follow the world. You know there's a better life, a better way, and it's all in Christ today, amen. Maybe that phone call at 2 a.m., have you ever gotten one of those? Maybe today you was on your way to the church and all of a sudden, you and your sweetheart all of a sudden said the wrong thing. Somebody said the wrong thing. And all of a sudden, there was an argument that broke out. How in the world you can argue in the parking lot and come in here and put a smile on your face? I've never known that. I've actually had people come to church and told me we argued on the way to church and we argued on the way home from church. But in church, you would have never known it. They, they tried to cloak it. Well, let me tell you what, you can't hide it from God. Amen. You was cussing him out on the way to church and she was cussing you out on the way home. It don't work. Maybe it's when you had come through a big victory. Oh, you felt so encouraged. Then a problem showed up. Sweeps your feet right out from underneath you. You fall flat on your face. It's those moments. You don't even know if you're going to breathe again. It's those moments that you just feel like, I'm going and getting to bed and pulling the covers over my head. It's still going to be there when you get up. Peace only comes through confrontation. And the only way you're going to solve your issues, whether it's sin, whatever it is, is to confront it in Christ. You've got to confront what you're facing. You can't sweep it under the carpet or lock it in the closet or do something else with it. Get it right with God, amen. That's the solution. And that's exactly what happened to Joshua in chapter 7. Israel, God's people, had been defeated and realizing that God is nowhere to be found. I'm going to tell you, God was never going to condone your sin. You say, well, God's with me at all times. He may be, but let me tell you what. He's not going to sit there and say, go ahead, do what you want to do. It's all right. I'll just turn my head and won't look. It doesn't work that way. Let me tell you something today. The people now, the Israelites are shell-shocked by what, is a ha what has happened, what has been accomplished. And underneath all that hurt that they've got is the infestation of sin. We live in a fallen world, don't we? Satan is waiting to just drop his talons into you and to lead you down the path of destruction. Oh, it can't happen to a Christian. Oh, really? You better rethink that. You get your eyes off of Jesus, you become. I didn't say you lose your salvation, but let me tell you what. You can lose the joy of your salvation. If you don't believe that, read Psalm 51. And what did David cry out? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, Lord. Why? Because he had sinned. Because he'd gotten his eyes off of God. Because he wasn't where he was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to be doing. 
We breathe in the suffocating air of the world that is full of sin that chokes us up and restricts our breathing and our spiritual life. And then we wonder why we're not effective for God. Amen. There's sin and it comes in the camp and all of a sudden it affects us and affects our homes and our families and our children. And all of a sudden we're living in a place today of defeat, discouragement, and we don't know what to do. You turn to God is what you do. Amen. So as Christian people, we're so thankful for the gospel today because that's the difference maker. Thank God for Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. Thank God that we have a promise given to us by him today. And as humans, we are disfigured. We're fallen people today. And it's all because of our sin. Sin today will destroy you. Mark my word. God, in his gracious love, gave his son, Jesus, as our redemption and he did that through the mercy that he had for us. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, and we are quick to judge them, I can't judge them because we're just as sorry and sinful as they were. Amen. Amen. But aren't you glad God didn't say, did, drop, did? Aren't you glad that his mercy? Amen. If you don't believe his mercy there, read Genesis 3.15. Because when you look to the cross today, you see God's mercy on display. What a beautiful picture of the mercy of God that says, I will forgive you. I will change your life. Why aren't we cleaving to that? We listen to all the insanity of the world is telling us today. We listen to all the lies that everything is being belched out in our society today. Why don't we run to the truth? Run to the cross. Embrace the Savior Take up your cross and follow him and watch him work amazingly and mighty in your life. Amen. Amen. This brings me to my theme. The trouble with sin is that it's trouble with God. Amen. Remember, Israel had suffered a terrible, tragic defeat in this process. And you know why? All because of sin. That was the problem. Let me give you three points. Don't have a poem. But you weren't expecting that anyway, were you? I said, Preacher, I don't know what you ate and drank in Tennessee, but you were insane this morning. I've been drinking from a fountain that never runs dry. You'll figure this out in a few minutes. Amen. How about the pain of sin? This is found in verses 6 through 9. Here is the feeling of devastation that they have experienced. At this point, Joshua, he doesn't know this about this issue with Achan and what he had done and there was sin in the camp and what had gone on. He was just overwhelmed by how that such a small little town as Ai with two to 3,000 Israelites, how could you be defeated? What went wrong? What did y'all do? I can only imagine some of the words that maybe he said. One thing he does know is the consequences because 36 of his people are now dead. So this is the grief and the pain. And if you're not careful, grief and pain can be poured out in your life. I'm glad today that you can give your grief and your pain to the Lord. You don't have to carry your grief. When there is a sufficiency of grace to lift it from you. There is a God who loves you with an everlasting love. There's a God who will bring you through. Don't you experience grief in your life, Pastor? Yes, I have, and yes, I still do. But I made a decision that grace was greater than the grief. And I can live in the grief and carry the pain and the problems and the weight on my shoulders, but I can't bear it. Neither can you. But that's why Paul said, or God speaking to him said, my grace, God's grace is sufficient for you. Let go of the grief. Let go of all the shame. Let go of all the pain and give it to God. And his grace will lift you up and carry you through whatever you're facing today. I don't know how many people have asked me, they said, your wife has been dead four years as of Friday last week. Have you gotten through that? Don't you feel any grief? Don't you sit and cry all the time? 
No, I don't. Because I tell you what, let me ask you, what does that accomplish? Don't you have any feelings towards your wife? Oh, you only, you can't imagine how much the three of us miss her. But I know what Cynthia Duck would do if I sat around moping and crying all the time. When I got to heaven, she'd take me to the woodshed <laughs> and whoop up on me. We've talked about this throughout life. But see, there was something greater than the grief. It's the grace. And God will strengthen you through those places in your life and give you the strength. Sure, I shed tears. Sure, I have broken places. Tiff Drew does too. You do too. I looked at Loretta yesterday. Her precious sister Doris had gone on to be with the Lord. We know where she's at. But it doesn't take away the issue of grief and the sorrow that you feel. But we also know that we don't let this overwhelm us. We let the power and the presence of our God overwhelm us and bring us through that. Somebody needed that. I'm glad today he said a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. That's our God. With Joshua, let me tell you what, are the elders of Israel. These elders weep with Joshua over the sin that's invaded the camp and thank God for the comfort that our God can give. You know, thank God for the comfort that we can find in this church today in the presence of the Lord for his people today. You don't have to shoulder what you're going through. You can do as Peter said, you can cast your every care upon him because he does care for you today. Verse 7, Joshua cried out, and I brought that to your attention. O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? That wasn't God's plan. The reason that they were in sin was because of their choice, not God's. God, listen, why did you let it happen? God, why am I going through this? Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Oh, we've heard all the stories, haven't we? Be careful that today you don't get wowed in the, uh, in, in, in the world of why all the time. Because it will. It'll drain you. It'll rob you. It'll destroy you today. Listen, you better be careful. And today you better start remembering today and not forgetting the promises of God. Don't forget the blessings of God. Don't forget the goodness of God. Don't forget the grace of God. Don't forget the power of God today. Listen, there are a multitude, a myriad of things today, what God has done for us. We need to look to him and say, thank you, Lord, for blessing me, being with me, bringing me through, helping me, forgiving me, being there. Thank God we have such a God on our side. He never fails us, amen. Don't find yourself rotting in a pool today of grief because it's going to destroy you. It's going to rob you. It's going to take away your joy. Joshua's at the bottom in verse 8. And he comes into the reality. And he regains his focus finally. And we've all been there. Let's not beat him up. We've all been there and lost our focus. But thank God we can regain it. And realizing today, he says, God, what does this, thing, what does this then mean to your glory? What glory are you going to get out of this? And God can bring glory out of any situation in your life. Let me say that again. God can bring glory out of any situation in your life. I keep picking on poor Derek. Bless his sweetheart. He's growing hair. Have y'all noticed? Man, he's looking good. Amen. Through all that this couple has been through, I've never heard them crying out, Why? Why? Why are we going through this? All I've heard is, God how can you be glorified through this? And we're going to trust you in what we end. And they're not the only. There's many folks sitting in this congregation and watching by that camera today that's been in that same situation. See, the trouble with sin is it, it's trouble with God. Secondly today, the remedy for sin, verses 10 through 15. These are short, the next two. I'm so glad that God gives a remedy for our sin for all the broken places in our lives. First, God said to Joshua, get up! 
You can sit there and feel sorry for yourself and wallow in your mire of, of, of grief and trouble and problems and pain. Or you can get up and move forward. When you sit, you know what happens? You start failing. You can't stay like you are in what you're in. You've got to get up and move forward with God. So today, this is not, this is not the preacher coming up and saying, get over it. No, I'm not telling you that. I would never tell you that. I'm telling you today that God is a present help in time of trouble. And today, the only thing that you need to do is to get up and move forward by trusting God. Amen. God's telling Joshua, you've got to keep going forward. You've got to press towards that mark, that prize, that high calling that is in Christ today. Secondly, in verse 11, God tells Joshua what is going on. He talks about it and he tells him about this. You've got to deal with the sin in the camp of what Achan has done and the effect that that sin has brought upon the tribe of Israel. And, and you know, it's not about therapy. We enter this issue of therapy today. Instead of going to the cross, we've got to go get everything done to us. We've got to get out, oh, let me read this book and listen to this CD or listen to this motivational speaker. Let me get this and let me get that. You know what? It hasn't changed a thing. All that stuff maybe is good to a degree, but let me tell you what. The real change comes at the cross in Christ. That's where you find the help. Confessing your sins is one of the most liberating things that you can do in getting right with God. Bring it to God. Whatever you're facing, thank you, Lord, that you'll take it. And give me victory through it. Amen. We don't need therapy. We need cleansing. Amen. Third, think through the consequences of what sin brings. Achan's sin has affected the entire camp of Israel. It has a profound effect. We're living in a day what is called cultural Christianity. And we're seeing the destruction of our Christian beliefs. I am appalled today of where... Christianity is going in some of these churches today that's embracing a cultural Christianity mentality. There's something today, there's something wrong when we claim Jesus as Savior, but we never follow him and serve him. What's wrong? It's not what's wrong with God, it's what's wrong with us. Fourth is a remedy. There's always hope with the gospel. You know I wouldn't bring you into this and beat you up without giving you some healing and a bomb of Gilead that today will heal your life. And that's Christ. That's hope. That hope is found in the gospel. The gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel brings what? It brings change to our life. Thank God we're not the same we used to be. Maybe we're not all we could, should, and ought to be. But thank God we're not what we used to be. And we're moving forward. Get up! Moving forward by the grace of God. Christianity is the gospel, and that gospel is Jesus Christ. And when you have that, thank God, it is sufficient, isn't it? The best thing you can do today, let me tell you what, too many people are running from God. We need to run to God. I mean, we need to even run to these altars this morning, say, God, oh, help me, Lord. God, help me, show me, bless me, give me hope. Lord, lift these pains of my life. Lord, give me direction. Lord, take these sins. Listen, when we run to God, his arms are open. It's just like the illustration about the prodigal son. What did the father do? The kid didn't come up the path, and the father said, come here. I'm going to slap you around like a red-headed stepchild. I'm going to get your, you don't, no, what did he do? He loved him. He forgave him. He cleansed him. He changed him. And that's what our God does for us today. Folks, what happened to Achan? He saw, he coveted, he took, and he did. That's the sequence that sin will bring in your life. You have to watch, as James warns us today, we've got to be careful how we are enticed by the world and sin. Desire comes, and when it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. What does sin bring about? Death. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. We have to be today opposing sin, not controlled by it. Understand the judgment of God. The judgment of God, when you realize there is a God of judgment, it will drive you today to the mercies of God that's only found at the cross. So verse 26 they stacked up stones and called the place the Valley of Achor. That's a bad legacy because you know what that spelled? Sin. 
You know what else it's spelled? What sin will derive in your life? Defeat. You know what then that brings about? Death. Is that what your legacy is going to be? Or is your legacy going to be for me to live as Christ and even to die as gain? That should be the legacy of our life. Our life should be today not the valley of Achor, but the valley of God's grace and mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, you can come to the cross today because his arms are open and he's ready to speak to our hearts to forgive us if we need forgiving, to strengthen us if we need strengthening, to direct us if we need direction, to help us in the places of life. God is always there. We may talk to people and get direction, but they are limited. There are no limitations with him. You can cast those cares and you can bring your burdens to the cross and there you can leave with the victory that God has for you. Look at your life and make sure first that you know him as your personal Savior and that you have received him into your heart and that you are S-A-V-E-D. It's not the Baptist church that saves you. It's not this preacher that saves you. It's the blood of Jesus that saves you and you've got to come through the blood. Amen. But I'm glad today that he will not only forgive you but he'll change your life and give you strength and help to live. That when you stand before him, as you will one day, you know what your legacy will say? As for me, it was Christ. And you can hear him declare, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You can find hope, and it's found only in Jesus today. Even in the valley of trouble, there's a God who will bring you out of that valley and bring you into a glorious victory of grace that he has for you. Bow your heads for a moment. Thank you, Facebook family. I pray you know Christ. I pray today your life has been changed. I pray today that we can bless you and encourage you. And may his grace go before you and help you. We love you and we're praying for you. Now, church, what need resides in your heart today? Is it the need of salvation? Maybe you've never asked Christ into your life. Would you, would you like to do that today? You can be saved right now, right here in this place by praying the prayer and repenting and asking Christ to save you and meaning it, and he will do that. Pray with me. Dear God in heaven, I am a sinner. I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve heaven. Thank you, Lord. You have made it possible through your blood that you shed on Calvary. Forgive me of my sin of rejecting you. Come into my heart and redeem me. Save me right now. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer a moment ago, I'm going to ask you to do something. I will not do nothing to embarrass you. No way. I would just want to pray for you. And if I can help you in the days ahead, I want to know I'm available and I will be glad to do that. But if you ask Christ into your life a moment ago, I just ask you to do one thing. Slip your hand up and just slip it back down. That's all you got to do. That you ask Jesus to come into your life and save you. Now, friend, listen. How about your life? Let's stand. Father, I pray the spirit of Jesus will move on us today. We have reason to come and give thanks to you today for what you have done for us. We have reason today to come and seek you and to live for you and to love you. We've got reason today to trust you in all things today. Help us to come to altars and pray one for another. As we've mentioned those that are in need of prayer today, early in the service, let us come and pray for them. Help us to come and love the Lord. May you today pour out your grace upon us and know today that is in Christ alone. That is where our hope resides and that's where our hope is found. Help us to come and to, Lord, taste of that hope that is only in you today. Would you?